Hello and welcome to our Black History Month series of Culture Vultures. I'm Rosemary Laye. Today we are in this superb room, it's called the Culture Space at Canada Water Library in South East London. And we're going to be honouring black poets who have made history. Helping me do this is the lawyer, the poet, the extraordinary, wonderful person, David Neaton. David, thank you so much for joining us on Culture Vultures. Thank you for having me, Rosemary. Looking rather dapper with your kente tie. Thank you, thank you, mate. <laughs> I only wanted to keep up with your standards. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So David, let's start off with poetry. I mean, yes. you know, you're a lawyer and you're a poet, but tell us about your own background because some viewers might be thinking, well, hang on, yes. lawyer, poet, how's that happening? Well, I couldn't do one without the other, <laughs> let's put it that way. I suppose I could do poetry without law, but I couldn't really do law without poetry because of the way the, the, the profession is structured and the creativity I bring to it. So I need something to kind of um, shape it into my own kind of personality. And poetry gives me that vehicle. Mm. Um, so yeah, so poetry has been something I've been doing since my youth, okay. uh, writing and reciting poetry. Just okay. love it. Okay. So we're going to talk about the poets who have made history you know, yes. in your own life and hopefully yes. in our lives as well. That's right. So we're kick, uh, kicking off with Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Paul Lawrence Your Dunbar. favorite. My favorite. Uh, in my view, Paul Lawrence Dunbar is the greatest poet that there is. Wow. Um, or that there was. That there was, um, he, uh, yes, he died about a hundred years ago, well, over a hundred years ago. Um, an amazing African-American poet, died quite young, yet produced so many volumes of poetry and um, novels and written work. And um, he actually made a living from poetry. Um, so this goes to show that actually poetry uh, it can be a profession, it can be an occupation, and a, uh, a well-paid occupation. Um, but really, his contribution was the culture and the words he left behind and the poems he left behind. Anybody who reads his poem, Life, will be convinced that he was an absolute technician at taking two emotions and working with them both, but to have the, the more inspiring emotion coming out at the end. And so the reader leaves with a sense of triumph. So he starts the poem by saying, life, a crust of bread and a corner to sleep in. Mm. And he goes on to talk about the misery of life. But then he takes the same words and then makes it as if actually there's something beautiful and hopeful about life. Because that same verse, a crust, of, a crust of bread and a corner to sleep in, he turns into a crust and a corner mm -hmm. that life makes precious. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, Not no, a crust no, and a life. corner that life makes precious, but a crust and a corner that love mm -hmm. makes precious. precious. And you see, so, so here he's, he's setting it for us that love makes all the mm, difference. Mm. And then you, have the, you even haven't even heard the rest of the poem. There are other, uh, but that's just a, an example, you know? Uh, so he talks about the tears, uh, you know, in the first verse, which is quite sad. But in the second verse, those same tears are the tears that refresh us. Mm, lovely. So, so, so I would encourage anybody to, to if it's one poem you're going to read, you have to read life. Mm. And it gives you a perspective of, is the glass half empty or is it half right. full? Right. Because he's working with the same raw material, mm. but he's coming out with a different product. Mm. In the first verse, it's depression. Mm -hmm. In the second verse, it's liberation and inspiration. Mm. Powerful point. I understand that uh, most of Paul's readers back in the days when he was alive yes. were actually uh, the white audience. He wrote for all audiences, but white, uh, the, the white population took to his work because, of course, you know, and think that's culture is usually, um, you know, um, uh, purchased and mm. supported uh, by the white community because his words, I, a lot of white people thought they were reading a white person ah. because, uh, because they thought this was like, this is a, like a new Shakespeare. Yes. But it's more accessible than Shakespeare, mm. and it's direct, and actually it, it's more flexible mm. because his style 
was such that he would write in English and he would also write in the vernacular of the African-American experience as well. Mm -hmm. And so what you were getting with Paul was long poems as well as shorter poems. You were getting deep poems as well as sort of more humorous poems. Mm -hmm. And all of them made you reflect and all of them uh, made you you, you know, think more deeply and reach out for more. Okay. It was a powerful poet. Okay, so that's your favourite poem. So that would be... Your po favourite poet. That would be my favourite poet. Yeah. So let's move... And, and, and before we move on to yeah. the... I just have to say, then, then you must read also... Um, you must read also We Wear the Mask by mm. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, which, which, which is a poem everybody should read as well. Because this business of wearing the mask is not just appropriate to the British culture, where they say this is where you have a stiff upper lip, yes. which is like wearing the mask mm -hmm. because you don't want to show your real emotions. Mm -hmm. But it's universal, this thing of wearing the mask. So young people, um, you know, you know uh, people from different groups, mm -hmm. I find themselves wearing a mask from time to time. And Paul's treatment of this subject, I believe people will find absolutely astounding. Mm, mm, mm. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I'm sure yeah. it's true today as it was. As, it, as it was. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Definitely. So thank you for that. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, your favourite poet. Yeah. And now we're going to move on to a phenomenal woman. A phenomenal woman. Another of my favourite poets. Mm -hmm. Now, Maya Angelou, Dr. Maya Angelou, what can we say? I mean, God bless her soul. Mm. She passed away this year, was That's it 2014? Right. In May of this year, yeah. In yep. May of this year. And left a legacy and, and, and continues to live out this legacy. She continues to live through her words, through us, of just absolute genius. Somebody with a very powerful emotional quotient. Um, uh, you know, if you take the, you know, your, your, your title poem, Phenomenal Woman, and look at that poem, it's a poem that every woman should read. That's yes. obvious. Yes. That's obvious because, um, because it, it, the point, the refrain of the poem is, I'm a woman, phenomenally phenomenal mm. woman, yeah. that is me. So you think this is a poem that every woman should read, and that is right. Mm -hmm. But it is equally important that every man should read that poem. Because if, uh, there's a, if, 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 if women came with an instruction manual, mm. that is a good piece of the instruction manual. Or this insight into, let me put it this way, this mm. insight into women. She, she, she captured it so well in this poem. And, uh, and so therefore she deserves to, to, to take her place as one of the greatest poets. Mm. Um, and of course, we, her poem, Still I Rise, yes. you know, such an amazing point. I mean, that phrase has almost become a branded phrase. Mm -hmm. You go to museums, galleries, books, you get this thing, Still I Rise. And I had the great pleasure of meeting Maya Angelou. Oh, you did? Oh, yes. I, I visited in her home in the Carolinas. And I tell you, what a gracious woman. Mm. Um, she was so generous, mm. not just with her space and her home and her hospitality, but with, it, with, with her own life, in yes. talking about her life and what motivated her and influenced her and so on. So, so to everybody she met, she treated like royalty. Oh, and so therefore she herself was clearly royalty yes. and poetry royalty at that. Yes, yes. Yeah. And was Paul Lawrence Dunbar her favorite poet? And that's the other thing. Um, her favorite poet was Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Mm. And, and, so, and, so, but, and I noticed when she reads his poems, she, she has a selection of poems she reads from, from Paul, and I have another selection of poems that I read from Paul. Right. So it shows how vast Paul is. Yes. So Paul has influenced so many people yes. by just different, and, and some of us have never even read the poem that that other person likes. Mm. But, so that's how powerful he was. And so, so she herself really is, is an amazing, absolutely stunning absolutely. Um, poet. Absolutely. Okay, so <coughs> your third selection, which is actually quite an unusual selection for me, Bob Marley, the singer. That's the surprise element, Bob Marley. <clears throat> Bob Marley, when you strip down all his great singing abilities and his ability as a musician, and you strip that all away, you end up with some powerful words. Mm. So, but so isn't I, that true of, of any singer? Of any singer, and this is where I come to... So, so it's true of any singer, but if you, a lot of the songs, it's so, right. So, so when you strip down his words, you get sheer poetry. Mm. If you strip down a lot of songs today, and the true test is this, strip away the music and try to read it through and see if you would be prepared 
to stand in a stadium and read those words to people. Mm. And a lot of songs we have today, without the rhythm and the music and the production, you would want to have nothing to do with it. Yeah. But Bob Marley's music, real, in fact, I have, I, you know, I've done covers of you know, other artists like Tracy Chapman and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, who is also a major writer. But let's go to Bob. So I've done Bob as well. I've done his, for example, Redemption song and read it all as a poem. Mm. And, and it's equally powerful. And let us just also say, he's somebody who loved the spoken word because yes. one of his songs, War, is a speech given to the United Nations by Haile Selassie. And he, he recognized the, 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 the beautiful prose in that text, but also the truth and the wisdom in that text, and turned it and converted it into a song, the song War. So people should go back and listen to that. So that's poetry, that's speech, and beautiful speech, poetic speech, turned into mm. a song. And then Bob Marley himself, when he was writing song, constructed it upwards from feeling. And when you hear Bob talk, he will say, when I'm going through these things in my life, mm. I consider it and I write about it. So he's, he's and, and, and it's an encouragement to all, for all of us. So two things. One, first of all, to recognize the poetry in all art fo mm. forms. So you can find poetry in, in songs, but you can also find poetry in drama, even in fine art, in dance, you can find poetry, it's there. Um, and, and, and also, whatever you're doing, so he was a singer yes. and a performer, whatever you're doing, you can introduce poetry. So even if you work in an office or you're a cashier, it can be done poetically, which adds beauty to the world, and Bob reminds us of that. Mm, wonderful. Yeah. Well, we've got some more surprises after the break. We're talking about black poets who have made history. See you in a bit.